Hi, everybody. Welcome to System Management and Quality of Life Committee. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started because we have a really full agenda today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Lynn Henry. I'm a medical oncologist at University of Michigan, and I'm joined virtually by my co-chair, uh, Mike Fish, who unfortunately wasn't able to join us today, but he is online. These are our disclosures. And so, as I mentioned, today we have a fairly full um, agenda. We are going to start with a symposium uh, with three speakers talking about sort of the spectrum of um, aspects of symptom control, ranging from measurement science to biological correlates. We're then going to talk about our two main protocols, which are in development and are soon to be launched. And then finally, close up with some active trial updates, as well as um, announcements and updates from our patient advocates. Uh, first, we do want to give a very warm thank you to our executive officer, Gary Lyman, who is uh, retiring from his post as executive officer for our committee. He will still be remaining active in SWOG, which is wonderful. And we wanna thank him for all the years that he has put in giving us tireless support. We also wanna welcome our our new executive officer, who is Catherine Crew. Um, if you are, are you here, Catherine? I don't see her yet. I'm sure she'll be in. Um, but we want to give her a well, warm welcome. Um, she has been an executive officer in the Encore side of SWOG, and um, things have been slightly rearranged. And she will be now working closely with us. So we look forward to that. Uh, our stats team is uh, led by uh, Dr. Joe Unger. Um, as well as Ria Vida and Celine Jones, um, all of these plus all of the other um, members of the STATS team uh, work really, really hard to both help us design new trials and also to analyze the trials that we already have, so we thank them a lot. Uh, we have um, our patient advocate, Dr. Amy Geschwender, who we are glad to see is back with us today. Um, Anne-Marie Mercurio has been um, helping out while she was out. And we really appreciate all of the hard work that she has done for us, especially as we've been launching these recent new trials. Uh, we also wanna acknowledge our VA representative, Dr. Park, um, our clinical trials project manager, Crystal Miwa, and our protocol coordinator, Mariah Norman. So I know we go through this every time, uh, but we do just wanna highlight what our vision is for this committee. And really, we want to be the best environment for the development, implementation, and conduct of clinical trials that create new understanding of mechanisms of symptoms, as well as new methods to reduce patient suffering. And we keep this at the forefront of everything that we do. You know, we think of ourselves as having some key attributes. We're multidisciplinary. You know, when you look around the room or at the people who are on Zoom, we have members from medical oncology, radiation oncology, surgery, nursing, basic science, pharmacy, um, advocates, biostats, epidemiology, I mean, the list goes on. And so it really helps for a committee like this and a, a specialty like this to really have this multidisciplinary focus. We really strongly encourage uh, participation of young investigators, um, either on our currently ongoing trials or on anything that we're newly developing. We are always patient-centered, but we want to be very creative in what we are developing. And then we want to really leverage the experience, dedicated and skillful and core network. Uh, we have a couple of um, priority topics and methods. Some of these are just what has developed naturally within our committee. And some of these are um, what has been um, decided upon nationally by our steering committee. So our clinical foci can typically are chemotherapy-induced neuropathy, immunotherapy toxicity, endocrine therapy toxicity, and cancer-related cognitive impairment. And in terms of methodologies, we have been quite successful doing some prospective cohort studies. Uh, we have been doing digital health interventions as well as behavioral and integrative medicine interventions such as acupuncture. But we also want to stress that these are not the only topics that we like to investigate. And so if anyone out there has any ideas related to symptom management and cancer more broadly, please feel free to bring them forward. If they fit within our committee, wonderful. If maybe they would fit within a different NCORE committee, we will help, um, help you figure that out. But we really strongly encourage um, development of ideas at the local level 
and then you know, try to bring them forward so that they can be investigated across the country uh, through methods like SWOG and NCOR. So please, um, if you do have any suggestions, let us know. And so now we wanna move forward with the symposium. And so uh, we are gonna have three speakers today. Um, I believe our first speaker is, um, a, is virtual. Let me just double check. Good, I see that she's on. So um, our first speaker is Dr. Jones. Um, she's an assistant professor at Fred Hutch in Seattle. Uh, she's a psychologist whose research focuses on cancer care delivery, the patient experience and quality of life. And while a lot of what she does is related to cancer care delivery, what we've asked her to really focus on today is what is a meaningful change? We always look at all these patient reported outcomes and you know, what, what level of change do you have to have for it to be meaningful to the patient? So Dr. Jones, we welcome you. All right, well, thank you for the uh, opportunity uh, to be here and talk about um, what is a meaningful change on a patient reported outcome, or uh, PRO. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna start a little bit with um, terminology and current practices and challenges. Uh, there's not necessarily like clear guidelines in the field. A lot of times people use the same term for, um, you know, for multiple different things or multiple terms for the same thing. So it helps if we, we have the same starting point. Um, also, if you can't hear me at all, um, just go ahead and, and let me know and I can, uh, can try and talk louder as well. We um, can hear after you. Oh, perfect, thank you. Uh, once we're, uh, uh, after that, I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the research that I've been doing uh, to try and address this issue of what is a meaningful change um, on PROs. I'll start with uh, my precision PRO studies, um, and then I'll uh, end with um, a few minutes on uh, a SWOG secondary analysis um, that we're hoping to, um, hoping to conduct soon. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so first, what is a meaningful change on a PRO? Uh, the definition is basically the smallest amount of change that a patient considers meaningful and that would require a change in clinical management. So this could be something like keeping a patient on a treatment that's working, adding another treatment if they have an adverse event, that sort of thing. Um, so this could include both decreases and increases in symptoms and quality of life. Uh, the minimally important difference, or MID, is one term that's used to refer to this. Um, there are a variety of other terms like minimal clinically important difference, clinically important difference, that sort of thing that are used to um, also refer to what's a meaningful change. And uh, sometimes when we're looking at it at the individual patient level over time, we call it a response, such as in like a responder analysis or that sort of thing. Um, this idea of meaningful change can be contrasted with what's a detectable change or what's a statistically significant change. Um, so sometimes this is referred to as the minimum detectable change or MDC. Sometimes it's the minimum detectable difference or MDD, um, but it's basically the smallest amount of change that can be detected given a PRO's reliability. So it's level of error or lack of error. Um, and this is actually very similar to the concept of statistical significance. Um, so when people say meaningful change on a PRO, they can actually be referring to any of these. Um, so it's important to be clear about specifically which, which aspect you're, um, you're focusing on. And uh, the majority of my research focuses on um, the first part here. So what is actually meaningful, not necessarily what is um, statistically significant um, or detectable. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just to make this a little bit more confusing, um, we can also um, make different comparisons. Um, and so it's important to clarify which um, level of comparison that we're talking about. Um, on the slide here, I just have a simple you know, two group design um, trial here. And so the first comparison we can make is within groups to so say looking in a group over time, which is represented by um, the black arrows here. I'm just seeing if there was a meaningful increase or decrease over time. Um, we can also look within the patient or within the participant, which is represented by the teal, um, the kind of greenish blue lines here. Um, so basically seeing for each individual patient that they experience a change, did they improve, did they worsen, did they have no change. Um, this is sometimes referred to as individual level change or responder analysis. 
um, when we roll it up to the group level and compare proportions of who's improved, worsened, or, or not changed between groups. Um, and then, of course, the classic between group comparison, which is represented by the yellow lines here, you know, either post treatment, um, if it's like an RCT, um, you know, or such as in like a case control design, that sort of thing. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so as far as actually how do we calculate what's a meaningful difference um, or even what's a, what's a statistically significant or detectable difference, there are a variety of ways of doing that. Um, on the slide here, I have them divided up as you know, group-based for group-based comparisons and individual level, um, but know that that's somewhat arbitrary. A lot of times people will take the group-based methods and apply them at the individual level and vice versa. Um, so at the group-based level, um, they're divided up into two kind of main categories. The first is anchor-based, where um, the PRO is linked to another outcome like morbidity or mortality. Uh, the problem is that PROs are oftentimes the outcome of interest. We're interested in quality of life. We're interested in reducing pain, that sort of thing. Um, so the way people have gotten around this is to use a single item PRO, um, either prospectively or retrospectively as the anchor. Uh, the problem is that single items are less reliable than multi-item PROs. So the multi-item PRO is essentially a a more reliable measure that's getting anchored to a less reliable measure. Um, the other method is distribution-based, uh, which is basically some statistical amount of change. Um, I've seen half a standard deviation, two times a standard of error measurement. Um, there are a variety of other methods as well. Um, so these can be, you know, because they're a statistical amount, they can be easily understood by researchers and clinicians, um, but there is a little bit of arbitrariness um, to them as well. Uh, when looking at the individual level, we can look at statistical significance at the individual level. Uh, one method is the reliable change index or RCI. Um, in psychology, we've been using the RCI for I think about 30 years or so. Um, and it's pretty simple. It's just you know difference from you know baseline to follow up and then um, different methods of determining what goes in the denominator of that equation, um, how that standard error is, is calculated. Um, also at the individual level, we can look at percent change from baseline on a PRO, um, and this is similar to those distribution-based methods, um, but it's a little bit more intuitive. So for example, if I have a certain level of pain, I can get an idea of like, okay, what's a 25% increase in my pain? What's a 25% decrease in my pain? And can have a sense of whether that's meaningful or not. Um, and I tend to see 10 to 30% in uh, medical studies and in psychology, we tend to use 50% um, change. Um, as meaningful. Uh, the one problem though with percent change from baseline is that it assumes PROs are on a ratio scale with a true zero. Um, and most PROs are actually usually on an interval scale rather than a ratio scale. Um, and then the last method I'll mention here today as far as you know, kind of current standards and, and uh, what other people are using is basically create just creating a cut point. You know, somewhere on that scale saying like, okay, if you're above or below this cut point, it means something. And that cut point can be created by anchoring it with another measure. So for example, in psychology, we'll use a clinician reported outcome of depression to anchor our PROs of depression. Um, other methods are bookmarking where a researcher will gather patients, clinicians, and other subject matter experts. Um, and they look at the PRO and decide, okay, this is mild, moderate, severe, very severe, and they'll decide where those cut points are. Um, the one problem with cut points though, is that you can have a very small change um, on a PRO and go from above to below the cut point and vice versa. Um, and that's both at the individual level and as well as at the, at the group level. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this has some implications um, for SWOG studies, the fact that there are so many methods and you know, there's not necessarily a clear standard. Um, this makes it really difficult for single arm studies. So you might be able to detect a statistically significant change over time, but it's hard to say, you know, was that a meaningful increase? Was it a, an adverse event? Was this a meaningful decrease in symptoms? Um, and that's even with like historical comparisons or norms. Um, it's a little less difficult in RCTs or even non-randomized comparisons. Um, you can still look for, of course, it's just statistical significance and that sort of thing. Um, but still determining what, you know, was that difference meaningful or not is a little bit diff difficult because the different methods can create different estimates of what's a meaningful difference. So it's hard to tell which treatment was better tolerated. Um, did this exercise intervention meaningfully reduce fatigue? Did the proportion of responders to one treatment versus another differ? Um, it's a really difficult to, um, to determine that um, just because there's no clear, clear guidelines. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so one of the reasons why it's difficult to tell, you know, why we, it's difficult to tell like which method of defining meaningful change should be used 
um, is that a lot of these are very top down. They're very um, kind of externally defined. Um, so, you know, it's like we go up and do a study and decide like, okay, you know, five point change, this is what's meaningful. Um, and so it's very much saying like, okay, we're telling people what's meaningful for them. Um, and kind of intuitively that doesn't make sense. Um, you know, it's like each person is different in terms of what they consider meaningful. And so what we found is meaningful before might not necessarily apply to each person. What's meaningful for my quality of life might not be meaningful for your quality of life. Um, so I came up with this method um, called precision PROs um, to try and address this issue of, um, you know, being externally defined, not being um, tailored specifically to what's, what's meaningful for each patient. Um, I have to give credit to Scott Ramsey for helping me name uh, the method and also to um, Joe Unger, um, who has been my steadfast collaborator as I've um, been trying this you know, kind of uh, unique idea. Um, so the basis of the precision PRO technique is that uh, rather than us telling the patient what's a meaningful change for them, we actually just ask them to define it for themselves. Um, so we just say, hey, you know, this is your pain level, this is your distress level, you tell us what's a meaningful change. Um, and this was a relatively new idea. Um, so I first had to test it to see if you know, could people actually answer these questions. Uh, so we got a general sample of people with a variety of conditions like back pain, cancer, MS, arthritis, depression, that sort of thing. Um, had them complete the numerical rating scale for um, pain and distress intensity. Um, the numerical rating scale is that zero to 10 scale that probably everybody is familiar with or um, has had to administer uh, quite a bit. Um, and then we asked them to define, you know, given your current pain and distress level, what's a meaningful increase? What's a meaningful decrease on the scale? How would you know the treatment was working? How would you know that the treatment was successful? Um, and to see if they understood the concept, we looked for paradoxical responding. Um, so that basically would mean, you know, we asked them to define a meaningful decrease, but they actually gave us an increase. That would be an example of a paradox. Um, and for being a first pass, we actually have pretty good rates of paradoxical responding, with lower being better here. Um, for the increases and decreases. Um, for the version of the questions that asked about treatment working versus being successful, we had some more paradoxical responding for those questions. Um, so moving forward, we elected to um, continue asking people to define a meaningful increase and decrease instead. Um, and then for each of those questions, people were given a text field to tell us why. Like, why was that amount meaningful for them? Why was that amount a meaningful change? Um, and then we did a qualitative analysis on that and found a great variability in what people found meaningful and why. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and uh, these are actually uh, quotes from uh, participants for why they found certain amounts of change meaningful or not. Um, from the first two quotes, uh, those demonstrate that uh, for some people, it was a very small amount of change, even one point was meaningful for them. For other people, they had a certain amount of variability day to day in their pain and distress levels. So any amount of change would have to be outside that, that range. Um, as shown by the uh, third comment here in the first one in uh, the second row, um, for some people when they were thinking about if I underwent a treatment, some people wanted no pain or distress, there should be nothing left. Um, for other people, they were, they were accepting of, you know, there being a little bit of distress, a little bit of pain, um, as long as it was manageable. Um, it's represented by the last comment here on the, the first line. Um, some people were linking it to how noticeable it was. So could they ignore the pain? Could they ignore the distress? Um, and then uh, even though these questions were asking about pain intensity and pain, excuse me, and distress intensity, um, people were linking, some people were linking this back to frequency um, as represented by the uh, second comment on the second line there. Um, so they, they basically were representing each intensity level as a certain amount of frequency of pain or frequency of distress. Um, other people cited you know, dispositional factors like their pain tolerance level, distress tolerance level, um, or different medical conditions that they had. Um, and then as represented by the last comment here, um, by far the greatest, uh, most often reported reason was interference. So how manageable was the pain or distress? Again, even though we were asking about intensity, they were still kind of linking it back to that, um, to that interference level. Um, so again, great variability in terms of what people found meaningful and, and why. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, we wanted to then test this with a multi-item PRO. Um, as I mentioned, they're, they're more reliable, so we wanted to see if it, was, if it was possible for people to tell us what was a meaningful change for them individually um, when we actually gave them a, a multi-item questionnaire. Um, and so we recruited 231 people with cancer um, and pain to complete the Promise Pain Intensity Measure. Um, that's a three item measure of pain intensity. And uh, what we then did was um, tell them that uh, that pain measure is scored on a different metric, 
gave them their score, um, gave them some information about it. So this is the level where people with no pain would be at. This is the level where people with um, the max score on that measure would be at. And then ask them to define um, a meaningful increase and a meaningful decrease using that scale. Um, and the vast majority were able to define what was a meaningful change um, doing that. We also gave them a three item quiz just to make sure they understood the concept. So adding some quantitative data to our previous qualitative data. Um, and each question on the quiz was basically a story problem of another patient saying, you know, this patient considers this amount of change meaningful. Um, their pain went from X to Y. Did they experience a meaningful change by their own definition? And 72% uh, were able to answer all three of the questions correctly. Um, and 26% answered um, two of the three questions correctly. So overall, people seem to understand the concept that we were trying to get at, what was a meaningful change for them personally um, on their pain level. Um, and there was also a lot of variability in what was meaningful. Um, and there wasn't necessarily a strong relationship where the same amount of change uh, was meaningful for both an increase and a decrease for the same person. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is just a visual representation of um, what that looks like. So um, this is an alluvial diagram. Um, on the left side, we have the different point values that people considered a meaningful decrease in pain. And on the right side, we have the point values that people considered a meaningful um, increase in pain. Um, and this is a promise scale. So um, there's a mean of 50, standard deviation um, of 10. And the uh, bars on the left and the right represent the number of participants reporting each category and the crisscrossing lines represent the combination of those categories. Um, so the most common response for both decreases and increases was five points. More people considered a, uh, decreases under five points meaningful than more than five points. Um, but there was a lot of variability in terms of you know, what people considered a meaningful decrease and increase. So some people, you know, a very small amount of decrease in pain would be meaningful to them, but they needed a larger increase in pain before they considered it um, considered it meaningful. And then there were also a lot of people that, that felt vice versa, where you know, it was a small increase versus a, a large decrease. Next slide, please. Um, so as mentioned on a previous slide, um, 167 people from this study um, also completed the survey again about one to three weeks later. Um, so we wanted to see if the precision PRO method, having people individually define what was meaningful uh, what was a meaningful change for themselves, um, if it could be more sensitive than some of the current methods. Um, we chose to use statistical significance at the individual level, um, and then a distribution-based method of defining meaningful change. Um, in this case, we used two times the standard error of measurement, um, and it came out to about, um, I think it was 5.2 points on the scale. Um, so these two alluvial diagrams um, basically show um, the precision PRO categorization on the left, and then the comparison method um, on the right. Um, so for the precision PRO method, um, there were more people categorized as improved or worsened um, based off of each person's um, personal definitions of what was a meaningful change um, than the comparison methods. Um, now, these people were not undergoing treatment, of course, so this is very preliminary results, um, but it does seem to suggest that the precision PRO method um, might be a little bit more sensitive to change than, than other methods. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so our next steps are uh, to test this in other symptoms besides pain. I'm a clinical psychologist, so we're going to do this in depression and anxiety um, in people with cancer. Uh, and then we're also um, working on testing it in um, conditions besides cancer. So uh, I'm working with Holly Harris here at the Hutch um, to look at endometriosis, um, which is also characterized um, by pain. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so another reason why um, we, we have some difficulty defining what is a meaningful change um, on PROs um, is that we don't necessarily have a gold standard. Um, there's no uh, you know, clear, clear winner as far as like, you know, this method is the clear winner as far as defining meaningful change. Um, so I was talking with Evan Hall uh, once, and I also have to give credit to both Mike Fish and Lynn Henry for um, helping Evan and I um, solidify this idea. Um, we realized that we could actually use um, some SWOG data to, um, to, as a gold standard to address this issue um, because a lot of treatments in SWOG trials are known to cause symptoms or are known to impact quality of life. Um, so that could be our gold standard. Um, and so our idea is to basically compare a lot of these different methods. So some of the anchor-based, some of the distribution-based methods, um, and this would primarily be looking at between group differences. Um, so meaningful change at the group level, um, but we're also planning some individual level comparisons to see what methods of, of detecting change or of, excuse me, of defining meaningful change are uh, more sensitive 
Um, if everything goes uh, as planned, uh, we're also hoping to look across treatments and populations, the idea being to um, ensure robustness of the results. Um, and again, if everything goes as planned, um, the idea is to identify the method of calculating the MID or that level of meaningful change that is most sensitive. Um, if it's more sensitive, um, then that hopefully means you know, not as large of a sample size, more likely to detect uh, treatment effects. Um, and barring that, we're hoping to at least you know, eliminate some MID methods, some methods of calculating meaningful change that are not sensitive to known treatment effects, um, and at least uh, you know, uh, limit down the, the universe of options for defining meaningful change. Um, so this is a project that we um, that are planning and, and hoping to do in the future. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you again um, for the opportunity to speak here today, and I uh, welcome any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation. If anyone has any comments or questions, please feel free to come up to the mics, put them in the chat, or raise your hand online. Dr. Meiskins? Uh, Frank, Frank Meiskins. I've often wondered if there's been a sub-analysis in which the consideration of physical versus emotional symptom PROs, or for that matter, any symptomatology. For example, uh, physical would be itch, scratch, hurt, something like that. While emotional would be happy, sad, suicidal, things that affect the brain. Has there ever been a sub-analysis of PROs in these types of studies? A uh, sub-analysis, um, do you mean in of SWOC trials or, uh, or looking for a specific, specific? In, in, gen in general and in SWOG trials, because I think it's very relevant because a lot of emotional things are actually physical things and, a lot, and vice versa, and depending upon how you classify them. Yeah, uh, wow, well, that's, a, <laughs> that's a big question. <laughs> Um, as far as, um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure about SWOG trials, if, um, how much um, analysis has, has been done using the, the data there. As far as in, um, in general, for, for meaningful change, we do tend to find it differs um, for like physical symptoms versus emotional symptoms. And it tends to be very, um, very dependent on the exact construct um, of interest as well as the method of defining um, meaningful change. Um, and as far as like the relationship of physical symptoms and emotional symptoms, they're definitely related. Um, trying to tease apart like, you know, which, you know, which comes first or, you know, is it something else that's causing both of them? Um, you know, that's, that's still an open question, I think, for um, in a lot of areas. So, but yes, very interesting. Uh, <clears throat> Dan Hertz, University of Michigan. Um, so, my, I think that we started using these PROs because we wanted to inject some sort of uniformity in this process and get better data. And I think your figures really show nicely that you can't really get any uniformity because the patients just have very, very different uh, interpretations of how they're using these scales. And I, I guess here you're suggesting a sort of two-step process where we continue using the scale and then ask them how much of a change in the scale is meaningful. Wouldn't it be easier if we just either added a question or replaced the scales with a question that said, have you experienced a meaningful increase in toxicity X or a meaningful decrease? Like why even have the scale in the middle if we then need to ask them about what's meaningful? Yeah, that's a that's an excellent question. Um, and that's one of the issues with the, um, the anchor-based method that I mentioned before where people are using that single item. Um, a lot of times the especially with the retrospective item, um, it's basically a question that says, have you experienced a um, significant improvement? Um, yes or no. Um, or usually it's on like a five or, or seven point scale. So any improvement worsening, that sort of thing. Um, the one problem is that there's, there's a bit of a retrospective um, bias with that. Um, there's also um, you know, potential bias because people have undergone a treatment. So they, you know, they do want it to work and that sort of thing. Um, and when they've actually done analyses to see, you know, did people actually experience um, you know, any change at all um, in their symptoms over time, we actually find that that's, that's not associated with, with what they report on those questions. Um, so, you know, doing it prospectively, that's one reason with the precision PRO method, why I decided to do it prospectively, um, basically setting like a treatment goal. So like, this is where I, you know, where I would like the pain or pain or fatigue or whatever you're measuring, um, where I would like it to be, um, to try and get around that, that kind of retrospective, um, that retrospective bias issue. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a good question. 
And then one additional question that's on the line from um, Dr. Fish says, um, one thing I notice in clinical practice is that some patients use different words or language to describe their symptoms. Uh, for example, a patient with cancer-related back pain may score their pain actually quite low, but use the word discomfort or tiredness to describe the problem. So how might that be handled in clinical research regarding its influence on measurement of change? Yeah, um, and I think that's, uh, um, that's also touching on this idea of you know, each person is a little bit different in terms of what they consider you know, meaningful or how they describe something or how they think about um, their, their pain or their symptoms. Um, that's one reason why we tend to like the multi-item PROs um, is that they're more likely to capture that because you know, if one question doesn't resonate with someone, another question might. Um, so that's one option. Um, another, um, the precision PRO method that I, that I mentioned, there's actually a second part to it where we actually let people kind of build their own PRO, um, but then we use statistical techniques like item response theory to put the scores on the same metric. Um, so that might be another option where basically people can choose the questions, you know, that, that are most relevant for them. So maybe it's um, discomfort versus pain or that sort of thing. Um, and then we basically use statistical techniques to, to score the measures. Um, uh, so that's one option. Um, there have been, um, like in psychology, we do have a history of using these measures where we would just ask people to, you know, write in, you know, what's what's important for you, um, you know, what's, what's your most pressing symptom, that sort of thing, and then they just rate it on like the zero to 10 scale. Um, one problem with those particular scales is that we've had trouble establishing their psychometric properties, so establishing how reliable they are and that sort of thing, and so um, if we can't even get the, you know, the measures then that are set and have the, have the questions set, then it's hard to, hard to detect change on them, obviously. Um, so I think there's, you know, there's definitely active work being done in this area um, to try and address that issue of people using different terminology and, and that sort of thing to describe their, their experience. Thanks, Don. Yeah, so, um, you know, we started to include like the GP5, how bothered are you by your symptoms or, you know, in, in a lot of different trials. And just thinking about the individual components that contribute to that, like as a validation, I don't know if people have done that to try to get a sense of how much a specific toxicity contributes to how bothered they are by their symptoms? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, as far as I know, I have not seen an analysis where people looked at which, um, which specific toxicities and symptoms um, contributed to the level of, of bothersomeness. Um, uh, one nice thing about that question is that it, it just asks people to you know, kind of weigh you know, they basically do do the calculus of what's important for them. So, you know, it's like I have, you know, like some people have different levels of pain tolerance, which is, you know, totally fine. That's just how people are. And so the person weighs that and then they weigh, you know, other symptoms as well and kind of do that own, own calculus for themselves, um, as well as the resources that they have to you know, maybe cope with those symptoms or um, cope with those side effects. Um, so that's that's one nice thing about that question, uh, the the bothersomeness question. But um, and I, as far as I know, I haven't seen um, any analysis that um, that looked at each of the individual toxicities and symptoms and and which one contributed more versus less. So we have one final question. Yeah. So uh, thank you. I'm I'm uh, Hildy Dillon. I'm the advocate on the lymphoma committee. Um, did, did you include neuropathy as something that causes pain in this study? Because I know that feedback that I hear is that some people interpret their neuropathy as pain, others as just numbness or tingling, but, but more, it goes to Dawn's question. It's about their loss of functionality with either their hands or their feet, mostly, you know, complaining about their extremities. and impacting their ability to walk and their um, ability to use their hands, which could be critical in whatever their occupation is. So I'm just wondering if that was part of this study and something that you're going to be looking at in the future, because many of our newer therapies, this is a consequence. Um, hopefully it goes away after a while, but I'm just wondering if that was part of your definition of pain. Uh, yeah, that's a good question, and definitely peripheral neuropathy is um, you know, is, a, is a very troublesome side effect. Um, so, um, if uh, we defined pain uh, fairly broadly, and so if they had 
um, if they included pain, if pain was like part of their peripheral neuropathy, um, it would have been included. Um, we did not specifically ask about like numbness or tingling um, as a separate, uh, you know, as a separate, separate PRO that we used. Um, and we did not specifically use like uh, neuropathic pain questions in this one. Um, so we might not have captured all the you know, peripheral neuropathy and, and that sort of thing. Um, however, uh, we didn't necessarily look at function in this study, um, in the, the main study that I talked about today. Um, however, in future studies and in planned studies, we're hoping to do that. This was just another um, you know, kind of next step along the way after the numerical rating scale study. Um, and so we are hoping to look at things like you know, interfer pain interference, um, physical function, social function, that sort of thing, um, to try and capture those functional aspects, because that is also huge as well, not just um, the level of symptom, um, but also how much does it interfere with functioning and what are they actually able to do and are they actually able to um, participate and do the things that they want to do. But yes, so those are planned. Well, thank you so much for that very interesting presentation. I think it's important for us to be thinking about, you know, what these numbers actually mean when we're asking our patients. And I think also it's important to, you know, see this as an example of a way that you're going to be able to use pre-existing data uh, to try to learn more about PROs in general. So it's a good example of some way that you can use uh, prior SWOG data. And if others have ideas um, related to secondary analyses of pre-existing data, always please bring those forward. So thank you very much. So uh, next we are going to uh, switch gears just a little bit. Um, and I invite Dr. Xing Li to come up. She's an associate professor of biostatistics at Columbia University. And she received an impact award along with Dr. Joe Unger in 2019 um, from the Hope Foundation and is gonna present some of her work related to that grant. So her research focuses on implementation of normal design, sorry, novel designs for early stage clinical trials, um, as well as methods for summarizing and visualizing adverse events that better reflect toxicity burden for patients. And it's this latter, um, latter uh, topic that she's going to focus on today. So welcome. So thank you so much for inviting me to give this talk, and uh, we really thank the whole foundation for funding this through an impact award. And uh, the goal of the award was basically to figure out ways to improve the reporting of adverse events in clinical trials. And it was very open-ended. We wanted to try different approaches, and uh, that's what we've done. And I'm going to show you a little bit. We've done a lot in the last three years, uh, and I'm going to, I only have 15 minutes, so <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a little glance at it. Um, so in terms of collaborator, Joe Unger was also part of the uh, a PI on the grant, and uh, Wei Jia Fan and Don Hirschman helped us uh, from Columbia to give us clinical feedback and a lot of the programming. And we also like to thank the team uh, investigators uh, for the uh, long map um, for S1400i, uh, who were kind enough to provide the data for the uh, trial to be motivating example and an illustration of our methods. So when it comes to the reporting of adverse events, I think most of you are familiar, it tends to be very tabular and text. And a lot of it is basically choosing adverse events, treatment related adverse events that are, uh, that you wanna put on a table because the table is limited, right? So a lot of that is, you know, requires selection of adverse events. So what generally people will do uh, for most of the trials is to select either severe adverse events, like those grade three or higher, grade four or higher, depending on the numbers that you have, or to have some selection based on the most prevalent ones. So a lot of us will select the prep for uh, adverse events that are with a prevalence of 10% of higher or 20% of higher to include either in the text or in the tables. So a problem with that is that we with over a thousand AE terms and adverse event types uh, in the National Cancer CTCAE uh, and over 26 organ system organ classes, it may obscure a lot of the adverse events. So if I'm selecting for the, the ones that are the most prevalent, then there might be a lot of rare adverse events that never show up in the papers, in the reporting. And at the, at the same time, if I select for adverse events that are severe, then a lot of the moderate and mild adverse events probably you know, don't make it to the reporting of the, the, the primary paper. So our goal was to figure out a way to develop novel methods that would allow us to visualize data. We thought that definitely having graphical displays would be much better than tabular forms uh, for doing this. It, and it would allow us to put much more data. 
So in, uh, I'm going to give you a little introduction of the case example that we're using to illustrate our methods. So this is the lung map study, the immunotherapy part of the lung map, uh, S1400i. And this was recently published in JAMA Oncology uh, last year. Uh, and it was a randomized phase three trial that compared NEVO plus EP versus NEVO alone in patient with lung cancer. And it was the primary endpoint was overall survival. The secondary endpoints were progression-free survival and response uh, and adverse events, of course. Uh, the, so in terms of the adverse events, which we're gonna focus on, when we looked at the data, there were about 252 uh, patients that were eligible for the trial. We had about 125 in each arm. And when we looked at the adverse event uh, terms, uh, we saw that there were over 8,000 treatment-related adverse events reported. Uh, so this is a, a large number of adverse events for 252 patients. Um, so when we, then we dug a little deeper and we saw that for the AE terms, which is what we're trying to figure out given the high dimensionality of adverse event types, if we limit it to grade one or higher, which is meaning any adverse event, there were about 193 AE terms that showed up. Um, and out of those, if we say that we only limit it to those that are, have a prevalence of 10% or higher, there were only 19. So these made us a little worried. So if we were only selecting for adverse events that had a prevalence of 10 or higher, we would report on the 19, um, which would be only 10% of everything that was observed. At the same time, when then we looked at grade two or higher, there were 121 adverse events that were reported. These are AE terms, not events. Um, terminology, and then there were five AE uh, terms that were reported in 10% or higher of the patients. If we do this for grade three or higher, then there were 69 adverse event term, uh, types or terms that were reported. 31 of them were reported for, by at least 1% of the patients, which means at least one person had that. Uh, and then six of them had a, were reported in at least 5% of the patients. So this gives you a sense of how much of the data would not be reported if we use the thresholds and the severe criteria that we generally use. So this is what was published in the paper. And I wanna be clear, this is not like criticizing what they have done. This is just generally what everybody does. Um, we chose this paper because we thought immunotherapy would be interesting. Uh, and the paper actually showed that there was probably not much difference between the NEVO EP arm and the NEVO arm when we looked at adverse events. So the, what they did in the paper was that they selected, given the tabular form, they have about 20 adverse event uh, terminologies or types uh, in the table. And they selected them, basically, they selected any grade three event with a 5% prevalence, as well as all grade four and five events that were attributable. Um, we can see that if you had only selected the grade three with 5% prevalence, there'll probably be even less. And that's why they potentially added the grade four and five so that everybody, everything would be on the table for severe adverse events. Um, there's nothing about moderate adverse events in this table. And the text had limited information, probably the, mo the two most uh, uh, prevalent adverse events were uh, described in the text. So when we look at this data, it's really hard to get a picture of what's going on. Like we really, when you get a paper that has, when you know when it comes to the adverse event table, you really have to sit down and look line by line exactly what's going on. Um, and it really, when you look at this, it's not really apparent if there are any adverse events that are that different. Um, the numbers are small. There were probably a couple that kind of jumped out, but not, not that many. So um, maybe you can take a minute and see if anything jumps out at you. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is what usually what they look in the paper. <laughs> this is as big as I could get it. Uh -huh. So in addition to the adverse event table, they also showed uh, the immune-related AEs, and they used a, a, a data, uh, a graphical display, which had the different types of immune-related AEs. It, ha it had the color um, displaying like red and blue for the two uh, treatment arms, and then it had the intensity of the color to display the severity of the adverse event. So this is something, and from here we can see, for example, the first few bars do look a little bit different. So the, the ALT, the AST, uh, a few of them, um, I think the rash, the skin rash, does look a little bit different uh, between the treatment arms. And we, when we looked at this, we thought, oh, this gra the graphical display actually is much uh, better. You do have many more 
uh, adverse event types that you can display on the on the graphical form. So maybe this we, this is what we should be doing. Okay, so I'm gonna jump and uh, to show you what we have done. Okay, so this is our first graph. What we decided is we probably have to train people to look at, in order to include ever, every adverse event, we probably should start at the system organ classes because if we start with the terminology, it will probably just be too much. Uh, with 191 AE ter terms, it would be too much to put everything on, one, on 191 bars, for example. So we decided in order not to miss any adverse event, we would start with the system organ classes. And this is a graph that limits CO to the grade three or higher uh, to be similar to the table. Uh, so here you have all the system organ classes. Uh, we did it in a circular form uh, to give you a pretty, like a sense of um, basically the, 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 like a quick sense of what it looks like. And the height of the bar here represents the prevalence of the adverse event. Uh, the group is orange for a NEVO EP and then blue for NEVO. And the intensity of the color indicates the severity of the graph. So one thing that you can see from here is that, um, I'll let you glance at it first before I tell you what, uh, but in, in one, one of the things that jumped out at us that it was that a lot of the adverse event, you, you do see that many more, the NEVO EP arm was higher, the, the reported numbers were higher than the NEVO arm. Um, for most of the uh, system organ classes, that was the situation. I think the only exceptions here we can see is for a GI in which they were similar and the infections which they were similar. But for most of the other categories, uh, the NEVO EP arm had uh, much more. Okay, so that's, this is what I'm, I'm summarizing that a little bit. So NEVO and EP arm had higher rates of grade three or higher AEs for the majority of the SOCs. In this graph, we can see that if you wanted to look at grade four or higher, it may not be so easy. So uh, maybe we thought a different graphical display would be better, but you could see a little bit that there's probably more dark orange or uh, I guess red compared to blue in for grade four or higher toxicities. Uh, so when you look at compare grade four or five, uh, the, the NEVO EP arm still seems to have more. Okay. One thing that we thought that would help with the display was sorting the, the prevalence of the adverse events. So that's one thing that we kept. And this is another version of the graph. In this one, we're trying to see if you can compare side by side and you can let me what you like, but let me know what you like better. This is a side by side comparison without color. Um, they are fixed so that this, uh, the axis and everything is the same. Uh, the locations of the bars are the same. And it's just a, a, a look at what the, um, the adverse event looks like. Here you can see when you look at these two, you would say at first glance that they're actually pretty different. You say the one on the, the, the NEVO EP arm probably has many, the, the bars are higher, there's more or uh, darker colors as well. And um, it particularly shows that, for example, the uh, musculoskeletal, skin and vascular, you really uh, much more on the NEVO EP compared to the other arm. You also see that a lot of the categories are only present in the NEVO EP arm compared to the NEVO. So for example, cardiac and endocrine, uh, hepatobiliary and immune, you really don't have any in the NEVO arm, but you do have some um, in the NEVO EP. So this is uh, just to see, in this representation, we thought it was easier to see the dark red in the middle because you don't have the blue and the orange contrast. Here you do see that there's higher grade uh, higher rates of grade four or higher in the NEVO EP arm compared to the NEVO arm. And this is another, and as well as having the bars higher. And we've, uh, in our group discuss, uh, everybody likes a different version. So, <laughs> so this can be easily, uh, if we, we had, I had shown you with grade three or higher, this can be done for grade one or higher, two or higher. Uh, and it, that's what we meant uh, that is dynamic, that as you go through the graphs, you can decide what, you know, which graph is best for your trial. Um, so um, this, these are different representations. Uh, sometimes you may want to see if there's anything that pops up for any adverse event. Other times you may want to focus more on the severe adverse event if one of them particularly jumps out at you. So it, it probably will require some training to use these graphs to, to figure out the, the adverse event profile. 
Another graph that we're introducing is what we call the butterfly plot. And this is exactly the same information that we had in the circular plot, but it is basically having a, a, um, a central axis which mirrors the bars. And here they are sorted by the frequency of the adverse event. And you can see um, this is basically taking the circular and making it flat. Um, but some people prefer this um, rendition of the graph. And uh, here you can also see that it's pretty apparent that the NIVO EP arm has higher rates of toxicity compared to the NIVO arm alone. Um, and this is, um, we, you know, not, not so much for investigation, respiratory in general, and metabolism, but you can see in the lower for a lot of the ones that I've already mentioned that the, it, it's very clear that the NIVO EP has higher rates uh, for skin, for uh, vascular, um, you know, blood, um, and all of the ones below, the psychiatric, the cardiac, the endocrine and all of those. Okay, so this is another plot that we're thinking. So once you go into the system organ classes, it would be nice to figure out within system organ class if there are differences in the toxicity types that patients are experiencing. So this is, uh, you probably can't see the data dictionary, but the, ma the main goal here is to figure out, uh, to see if the, the um, the distribution of the toxicities within each category of system organ class is different. So here you can see for general, it is probably the, the both of the groups are having the same adverse event. But for example, in the in the uh, investigations, which are mostly labs, that the adverse event that are leading to the to the higher frequency in the in the system organ class are actually very different ones. Uh, so the, one group is experiencing a certain type of adverse event, while the other group is experiencing a different type of adverse event, even though they are in the same system organ class. So this would be a graph that could help you uh, get some information on that. Um, and then at the same time, especially sometimes for here, for example, uh, some of the categories you can see that they're, for example, gastrointestinal, the adverse events were completely different. Uh, so it, it's in, even though there were all GI uh, toxicities, the actual type of toxicity was different between the two groups. Um, the same thing with the um, nervous system. There were also, uh, when you look into closer, actually the nervous system, one is more stroke, the other one was more headache, uh, which is kind of interesting, uh, which probably it's, it's very different um, type of adverse event. So this is a graph that um, that would be of interest if you're, um, of course, for reporting, it may not, that's what we're saying, it might be dynamic, that you may wanna look at this and focus on the adverse events that are more different between the groups. Um, the other thing that we decided is after this, one thing that you may wanna know is to zoom in. So for example, you could zoom in in one category and have the table next to the adverse event graph to figure out the exact numbers that you're looking at. And this is just an example that shows you, uh, uh, you know, which adverse event. Here, the adverse events are pretty rare, and you can see that the actual percentage of people having it is not so, it's not that high, but the trial is actually pretty small. So uh, you can see that for AST increase, for example, you, you have a grade three or higher combined, it's about 5% versus 1.6%. Uh, in terms of relative, uh, that's a much higher, uh, you know, number, um, it's like two, twofold at least that they're having a high, um, the likelihood of having a AST increase in the NIVO EP compared to the uh, NIVO alone. And you can see also that um, there are some that happen almost mostly in one versus the other. So this would be a graph that would show you exactly after, when you hone in uh, what adverse events are, are the patients are experiencing. So we have created a web application that allows you to, um, um, I don't know if you can you click on it, in the link on the top. Can you click on the link or no, on the, on the top link? We have created a web application. Oh yeah, okay. So you can uh, yeah, you can scan the QR code, go on your cell phone. We have a web application uh, that allows you to upload your own data, uh, and you can get these graphs. Uh, you can um, we have it for two group, which is what I've mainly focused and shown you. Uh, it allows the comparison. Uh, oh, it doesn't work. Okay. Huh? Yeah, yeah. It's 
you can have your cell phone. You can it, it's a cell phone uh, friendly app, so you can <laughs> so you can do it on your um, you know take the QR code, go in. You, it has a sample data set that you can use. Um, I'm, we are looking for feedback, uh, so please try it um, for your trial. Uh, we're also trying to talk with uh, with SWOT for different trials that would be good that you think would be good uh, to illustrate the app to see if we can see more adverse events that the, the to compare the profile of adverse events of different treatments, uh, and you we can you know we'll be happy to to try the app. Uh, feel free to play with it. Uh, and you can send comments to um, Mr. Yes. Uh, th those are our emails. Uh, so for uh, you can send comments to myself or you, to Weija Fan, and we're gonna be here. Uh, so if you're playing with the app right now and you have any comments, let us know. Uh, they're still on a server that doesn't require a lot of users because we haven't made it public. Uh, so it might be a little slow when you're playing with it. <laughs> so so uh, once you, we, we're thinking of this is like a beta, beta version. So once we get your feedback, we will make it, uh, we'll try to incorporate whatever we can and make it into a, a public server um, so that you can have access to it. Uh, so we think this will be great for like a DSMB uh, meetings as well as for publications you can select which graphs you want on your publications and we have been actually using them for some of our trials already um, okay any questions yeah thank you very much um you can feel free to come up to the mic if you have questions i actually have one first um so this is really good for looking still at max toxicity grade and so have you been working on or thinking about any ways to try to look at toxicity longitudinally? Because that is sometimes if the, as important, if not more important than the actual maximum grade. Yeah, so this was basically focused on the toxicity type, the high dimensionality of toxicity type. We have another app that we're working on that actually looks, uses a Q-twist approach to summarize the duration of toxicity. So you'll figure out basically how long in the time that you're in progression free survival, how much, how long patients have been living with a grade one toxicity or grade two toxicity or grade three toxicity and so on. And you'll separate partition that space. So that's something that will, we have another app that hopefully will be coming on soon. Uh, I thought because there's much more statistics involved in that app to, to explain the acute twist, I didn't want to, uh, but we will have that as well. Great, Dan. Dan Hertz, University of Michigan. So in the example that you showed, it seems like the relevant clinical question is how much added toxicity do you introduce from adding the IPI to the NEVO, right? Mm -hmm. So did you consider any plots where instead of having each arm plotted separately, you just have a single bar that represents the difference between the two arms, which would really just isolate the added toxicity from the IPI? We, we didn't do that. Uh, so that's a good question. So in this scenario, you could, look at the, the relative, uh, but we wanted to create an app that was more general for any two arm study. Um, so that, that's the, the focus for this, yeah. But we could look at, in, in terms of this particular trial, we could look at that. Well, thank you very much. We will um, be able to distribute these QR codes if you want. Yes. Um, and also anyone who isn't on our email list, you should be, let us know. Uh, but also um, this is being recorded and so it will be available also if anyone wants to go on and provide feedback i'm sure it'd be greatly appreciated yeah, send us emails with feedback and then we'll improve it and <laughs> thank you thank you and so next i'd like to introduce uh dr dan hertz he doesn't just ask questions here he's also speaking today um, he's an assistant professor of pharmacy at the university of michigan and is interested in developing tools uh, for individualizing cancer treatment um, and has a particular focus on paclitaxel and breast cancer especially neuropathy um, he has been a recipient of prior hope foundation funding including seed grants and uh, most recently, he collaborated with the study chair for the S1714 trial, our neuropathy trial, on an R01 submission to look at translational studies, and they received an excellent score, which is fabulous. We look forward to more uh, research outcome from that trial. Uh, but we asked him here today really to provide a different perspective than the two um, 
types of data analysis we were just talking about, really trying to look at the translational um, medicine components of our symptom management trials. And since he's done a fair amount of work in this space, we wanted him to give his experience uh, with leveraging SWOG really to try to help build his career. And in the hopes that this will inspire others of you in the audience uh, to do the same. So welcome. Great, thank you very much for the invitation. So I'm gonna start just by briefly introducing taxane-induced neuropathy, which I know most of you know a lot about, so I won't spend a lot of time doing that. And then I'm gonna go quickly through two projects that sort of illustrate the two different ways you can go about doing translational medicine research in SWAG. And then I was asked to give sort of some general comments on translational symptom science in SWAG, so I'll end with that. So as we all know, taxane-induced neuropathy is peripheral and progressive. It starts in the fingers and toes. It decreases quality of life. There are no effective prevention or treatment strategies. So oftentimes you have to decrease dosing or discontinue dosing. And we have found some risk factors that I have listed here in sort of smaller studies, but none have really been validated and translated into clinical care. And then I'll just remind everybody that we have sort of two main ways of collecting neuropathy data, one being the CTCAE, so clinician assessment that we're all very familiar with, and then PROs, which we heard a lovely presentation from Dr. Jones earlier today, that are considered to be more sensitive and reliable. And I always include a question mark there because I have some skepticism about that. And I think it's, I've never seen actual empiric data that's more convincing than Dr. Jones' data, that there's some concerns about the use of PROs in terms of how patients are thinking about them and how uniform they are. So I think that we should really think about that in our translational medicine um, studies. So before I get into the two SWOG studies, I have to sort of introduce some pilot data that we had. So this was a University of Michigan observational study of 60 patients with early stage breast cancer receiving weekly paclitaxel, and we collected PRO data over the course of treatment. We also collected samples to do biomarker work. So I'll show you some of our vitamin data where we looked at vitamin D and other vitamins that have been associated with neuropathy in other disease states. And we used an approach called metabolomics, which just measures physiological metabolites in the system uh, that are dynamic during treatment. So jumping straight to the results, we found that patients who were vitamin D insufficient had higher rates of peripheral neuropathy. So you can see here on the vertical y-axis, that's the maximum change in the CIPN8 severity. And on the left-hand side here is your vitamin D insufficient patients with much higher neuropathy than the vitamin D sufficient patients in this sort of exploratory discovery phase analysis. Similarly, in the metabolomic study, we looked at about 30 metabolites. We saw some evidence of a potential inverse relationship with histidine, where patients who had lower histidine concentrations at baseline had higher rates of peripheral neuropathy. So that is what brought me to SWAG to try to find a clinical trial with available samples that we could try to validate these results in a much larger confirmatory analysis. So here's the SWAG 0221 clinical trial. You guys might be familiar with this. It's a breast cancer trial that was looking at different regimens of standard ACT treatment. So all the patients on this study received paclitaxel, but in either the weekly or biweekly regimen. There was CIPN data collected both via CTCAE and in a subset of patients, the PRO. There were also some analyses done using survey data of behavior that found that patients who were receiving multivitamins and patients who had higher grain intake were actually had less neuropathy. So maybe there's some protective effect of those. And we want to try to mechanistically validate those by actually using the available samples to figure out what's going on in those vitamin levels or in those metabolites that might explain these associations. So that was the objective of our translational medicine proposal. So here's some recent data that we reported at ASCO. We found in our analysis that again, patients who were vitamin D insufficient had higher rates of CTCAE grade three or higher peripheral neuropathy. We consider this a validation study. This is a very large analysis with a single primary endpoint. So you can see here in the, over the whole study, about 15% of patients had CTCAE grade three or higher neuropathy, and about a third had vitamin D insufficiency. And you can see an odds ratio of about 1.6. So a 60% increase in the risk of peripheral neuropathy in your vitamin D insufficient patients. 
We then reached out to another group that does some animal studies. I'll only go through this very briefly. What they did, they have an animal model of peripheral neuropathy. They put some mice on a vitamin D deficient diet and they kept some other mice on a regular diet. And they looked at peripheral neuropathy before that diet, at the end of that diet. And then they treated those mice with four doses of paclitaxel and looked at the peripheral neuropathy afterwards. So on the right-hand side, you have the results of that. Uh, what I will do is just focus in on the most important parts. So you can see at baseline, all the mice have pretty much the same mechanical sensitivity, which is a mouse phenotype indicative of neuropathy. Prior to paclitaxel treatment, after just eight weeks of this vitamin D deficient diet, you can see in the triangles, that's those two lines that are decreasing. So the vitamin D deficiency without any paclitaxel increases mechanical sensitivity, suggesting that it causes peripheral neuropathy in, in this mouse model. Then in the orange lines, when you add the paclitaxel, you can see that the mice that get paclitaxel have even further uh, increases in mechanical sensitivity. And at the end of the treatment, it's actually the mice that have the vitamin D deficient diet that are receiving paclitaxel that have higher mechanical sensitivity or more sensitivity or more neuropathy than the mice on the regular diet. So sort of a mechanistic animal study suggesting or supporting our findings. I also mentioned histidine. We tried to do a, a validation of that in our analysis. And what you can see in the top line, that's our peripheral neuropathy patients. And in the line right below that, that's the no neuropathy controls. And you can see in that box plot, absolutely no difference in the histidine. So when you go and do biomarker sciences, you don't always validate everything, or a lot of times you don't validate things. So histidine, we don't think is a true biomarker, and we're doing further analyses to see if there are metabolic biomarkers. So just to give you a sense of what it looks like to try to do translational medicine science in SWAG, I have here a timeline. So I presented our preliminary data from our pilot study in April of 2018. I'm not gonna go through every step of this, but it took us almost a year to get SWAG translational medicine approval. That was primarily our fault. We first went through the navigator process. I don't have time to describe to you, but it is important for you to understand the sequencing of these processes. After we got SWAG translational medicine approval, it then took us a few months to go back and get our navigator approval, at which point we started asking for funding because we needed a lot of money to do these studies. We submitted funding requests to ACS, to NIH, to HOPE, et cetera. Three years into this process, we finally got an ACS award. So you can see it took us about a year for these approvals, almost two years to get funding. So we're three years into this process before we actually start doing any research. So this is a long process. As soon as we got those that funding, we started doing the work. And in the past year, we've done all the work that I just described to you. And we have a manuscript that's about to be submitted in the next uh, week or two. Okay. So moving on to SWOG 1714, I have to first go back to this pilot study in addition to the vitamins and metabolites that I just talked about. We also collected data for pharmacokinetics, so measuring paclitaxel drug concentrations at the end of first infusion, and pharmacogenetics where we looked at sequencing of genetics, as genes associated with inherited neuropathy conditions. Similar plot, again, on the vertical axis, we have the severity of neuropathy, and you can see in this plot that I don't have time to go through in detail. It is the patients on the far right who had the highest paclitaxel concentrations, the highest Cmax, that had the greatest increase in peripheral neuropathy over the course of treatment. So this is sort of very well established at this point that higher paclitaxel exposure is associated with higher rates of peripheral neuropathy. Um, we don't do anything with that, but it has been validated in many, many studies. We also showed in our discovery analysis that patients who carry this variant in the EPHA5 gene, which has been reported in multiple genome-wide association studies to increase risk of neuropathy, it's actually the patients who are homozygous for this variant that have a very severe, very dramatic increase in peripheral neuropathy over the course of treatment. And these are all, again, discovery phase biomarker studies that we want to try to validate in clinical trial cohorts. So that leads me to the study that Dr. Henry mentioned, SWOG 1714, which is a prospective observational cohort study, where the main purpose is to create a prediction algorithm using clinical variables that might help us predict which patients were going to experience taxane-induced peripheral neuropathy. 
I have written there the primary endpoint that, that uses the PRO data as the primary endpoint for this clinical trial. I believe that's what we'll be using for our biomarker studies as well. And I've listed there some of the clinical variables that we want to include in the prediction model. So my contribution to this study was to lead the translational medicine parts of it. So we collected lots of samples and we are now going to go and see if we can integrate some biomarkers into this prediction model. So here's kind of the schema of 1714 looks very similar to the pilot study that I ran at University of Michigan, although it's much larger, it collects data for many more years, and it's a less heterogeneous cohort, so it's paclitaxel or docetaxel across several different tumor types. And you can see, in addition to the PROs, we are doing several different types of assessments, clinician assessment, patient assessment, objective assessment, all kinds of things throughout treatment and out to three years. We then included sample collection so we could do all the translational medicine we want so we are collecting and measuring pk we have samples for pharmacogenetics we have samples for vitamin d and metabolites and other kinds of biomarkers that we'd be interested in validating our prior work and also doing novel discovery so again looking at the timeline here as far as i can tell the first um uh, the, the first proposal around this was uh, to do an observational clinical study sometime in 2016 that was led by Don Hirschman. Then over uh, the next couple of years, we continued to develop that. And I was brought in as the translational medicine chair sometime in 2017, and it got DCP approval after a year and four months. Then it took another year and four months for the study to get activated during which time we started submitting SWOG translational medicine proposals for reasons that are not worth explaining. We've actually submitted and had approved three separate TM proposals for all the translational medicine studies that we now have approval to do. Accrual was complete five years into this process. You know, if you guys work in clinical trials, you know how long it takes. We then submitted our R01 earlier this year, as Dr. Henry mentioned, got a very strong score and we are hoping to get our notice of award any day now. I actually just checked my email to see if we had gotten it today. We really think it'll come sort of any minute. And again, we're now six and a half years into this process and we haven't started actually doing any translational medicine research. So again, it's a long process. So here are the aims of our R01 proposal. The first is to look at physiological biomarkers. The second is to look at genetic biomarkers. And the third is to then integrate those biomarkers into our clinical prediction model. So we have one integrated risk prediction model that includes both clinical variables and whatever physiological biomarkers uh, we are able to validate. So again, I was asked to provide some comments on translational science in SWAG. So that's what I will close with. Um, as you can tell, I don't mind being a little controversial, so we'll see how this goes. So, there are two options that I've illustrated in our two different studies. One is to do retrospective analyses of existing data and samples. This is a slow process that requires many rounds of review and takes a long time. And you're sort of limited to whatever samples and data are there, and that has limitations. The alternative is to do a prospective study where you collect your own samples and data. Unfortunately, that's an even slower process with even more rounds of review, but you can collect all the samples you need and all the data that you need to do whatever analyses you wanna do. So they're both available, both take a lot of work and time, but doing biomarker validation is kind of only possible in large prospective clinical trials. So doing it in SWOG is kind of your, your only option or other you know, large clinical trials. Um, if you are thinking about doing this, I would definitely recommend working with the SWOG protocol coordinator so you understand the process. As I mentioned, we spent uh, several months doing the wrong thing at the wrong time in the wrong sequence. So make sure you work with them. They know the process and can shepherd you through it. There is always this question about should we go for funding before we get approval from SWOG or should we get approval from SWOG before we go for funding? I've always gotten approval from SWOG and those approvals and actually obtaining the samples are contingent upon you getting the funding, but I have found in reviews of grants that if you don't already have the approval to get the samples, there's a major feasibility issue. So really you have to get the approval first and then you go and get the funding. As much as possible, you can kind of try to do them in parallel. 
um, but there is sort of some things that have to be done in sequence. The other thing is I wouldn't recommend that people who aren't biomarker scientists necessarily try to take on a project like this on their own. It requires expertise, methodological, statistical. It requires some people and we have that expertise in SWAG. I'm here and would be happy to hand you over to other people that I know that work in this space. I'm working with Michael Wu in the Statistical Center, who is a translational medicine statistician. So the expertise is available. And I would recommend having someone like that on your team because this isn't something that you can just sort of dabble in and it takes years to do. So in terms of the future of translational symptom science, we will continue to see advancements in all sorts of aspects of this. So the phenotype collection, we've talked about the transition from CTCAE to PROs, and now I think we're going from PROs to wearables and objective measures. So we have lots of different ways of phenotyping our patients in terms of toxicity, and we really need to think carefully about which one is the best, most accurate, and should we do integrated analyses or, or how do we think about this data? In addition to the phenotype side, we will continue to make advances in sort of the methodological, methodological side. So we're going from single SNP analyses to whole, whole sequence analyses. We can do micro sampling for PK. We can do single cell analyses. We can look at microbiomes, all these sorts of translational um, approaches. And we need to think about which ones are best to use for which toxicity. In addition to that, there's a lot of analytical advances that make these analyses possible. So you might have heard about polygenic risk scores, which we now use pretty commonly in genetics. There's a lot of use of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning to take these comp complex models from all the data. So if you think about our 1714 analysis, where we'll have lots of clinical variables and also perhaps several different complex signatures from uh, physiological data, you need complex analytical approaches that can find those signatures. Which is all to say that there are going to be challenges. So early biomarker science has a lot of false positives. That's why it's important to do sort of um, well thought through validation studies. And these machine learning models, we will get sort of uninterpretable signatures that we are either going to have to believe or not, but we won't know exactly how they're working. That's a lot of times how these machine learning models work which is all to say that the future of translational medicine and symptom science is more complex than it is currently. The sample collection is gonna be more complex. The sample analysis is gonna be more complex. The clinical translation is gonna be more complex, right? So the future is more complex algorithms that might be able to tell us which patients will experience toxicity and which ones won't. Which brings me to the real problem, which is that we currently have very simple tools to predict which patients will experience toxicity. So here's an example with DPYD genetics. It is a very simple test. It gives you a very strong prediction of which patients will experience very severe toxicity from 5-fluorouracil or capecitabine. We know that this benefits patients. We know that it reduces costs and reduces toxicity. I just published in JCO this evidence-based review demonstrating the clinical utility of doing this. ESMO recommends doing it. Europe does it as standard of care. It is expanding use in the US. Our brilliant co-chair, Dr. Henry, tests her patients. Dana-Farber is starting to test all their patients. So if you are a medical oncologist or a healthcare provider and you care about symptom science and you're in this meeting, you should be testing your patients. And if you don't know the data, you can go and read my article and see for yourself. The controversial part, and I really didn't want to say this without receiving my notice of award, is if we're not going to use the simple tools that are very predictive of toxicity, then we shouldn't bother spending time and money finding more complex tools that are going to be somewhat less predictive of toxicity. We are not going to find something that is more simple, cheaper, more easy to use, and more predictive of a severe toxicity than DPYD. And if we're not going to use that, then we shouldn't bother finding more complex things. Thank you very much. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, feel free to come up to the microphone with questions. I will also, just as people are walking up, I will argue that the only, sim, translational medicine is not only used to develop predictive biomarkers, it is also used so we understand mechanistically why some symptoms develop, and that can lead us hopefully to new intervention approaches. So. Uh, take the first mic and then the second one. Hi, uh, Richard Dunn from University of Rochester. Uh, one biomarker 
uh, you didn't mention one that we have a lot of access to are scans. So I, I have a particular interest in muscle mass and fat mass. And I was wondering if this is something that you were considering in, in evaluating the pharmacokinetics, because we know that fat-free mass uh, you know, takes a significant burden, uh, the compartment for cytotoxic uh, chemotherapy uptake. So is that something that you're interested in looking at in how it might affect outcomes with neuropathy? Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic question. There's a lot of data out there that patients with low muscle mass have higher rates of toxicity across many different chemotherapeutic drugs. We actually did an analysis in our pilot study where we pulled the CT scans from the electronic medical record, and we showed that patients with low muscle mass have those higher CMAXs, which we think is why they have higher rates of neuropathy. We are currently doing a prospective study where we are enrolling patients with normal and low muscle mass, and we are doing not a dose reduction, but actually an infusion lengthening from one hour to two hours in those patients with low muscle mass to see if we can normalize their CMAX. And then in the future, we would hope that we could use that approach where you can deliver the entire dose, but over a longer duration so you don't get as high as CMAX and you can hopefully reduce toxicity. So I have been thinking about that a little bit. We're hoping that at some point in 1714, we'll be able to go back and get the scans because a lot of these patients do get scanned for clinical purposes, but that requires us going back to each individual site and then pulling the scans and sharing them with us. So it's complex, but it is something that I'm thinking about. I think it's critical. I think it is a PK issue. And just doing that at scale is very challenging and adding research related scans or adding scans just for the purposes of predicting PK or toxicity is probably going to be challenging and more costly and more risky. Let's chat, love it. Yeah, thanks for that talk. Uh, Jim Heffley from Montana Cancer Consortium. Um, well, this, your talk reminds me of thinking about the vitamin A and vitamin E data from previous SWOG studies, and, and I'd like to comment on that. But also, even though the data is interesting, how do we know vitamin D isn't a marker for a lot of other problems? In the geriatric literature, it's associated with falls, uh, and we also still don't know whether the replacement of vitamin D will really change any of those things that we're looking at. So before we can even jump to saying, oh, well, vitamin D deficiency is bad, is it socioeconomic status? What is it that really is a marker for it? Maybe a marker for other things, poor nutrition overall, whatever. Uh, and so then the question is, well, should we replace people with vitamin D? Maybe not. We don't know if it's gonna change things or not. We don't know that until we do a big study and how hard a study is that will be to be. Whether the vitamin E study was quite uh, surprising when it showed more uh, prostate cancer. And, and, you know, when we think back about practicing 15, 20 years ago, every doctor was recommending vitamin A and vitamin E. Nobody's doing that anymore. Well, that was thanks to SWOG study. So the next big study is going to have to be a big vitamin D study that's placebo controlled. Yeah, th those are excellent comments. So I do understand that vitamin D insufficiency has been related to a lot of uh, negative clinical health consequences and a lot in a lot of studies that have tried supplementing vitamin D, they don't see any actual benefit from it. I do think in this case, we have some preliminary mouse mechanistic work suggesting that it is actually the vitamin D deficiency itself that is causing the sensitivity, at least in that to mechanical threshold testing. So we are seeing some evidence of a mechanistic effect. Um, I didn't I don't stand up here and say that everybody should be testing for vitamin D or supplementing vitamin D. I think there are some, and I'm not a clinician, there are some clinical spaces where patients do get supplemented for vitamin D. So my understanding is that after chemotherapy, breast, patients with breast cancer who go on AIs will get supplemented with the vitamin D at that point. So if you're gonna do the supplementation anyway, you can do it on the front end. There's no risk to it. It's safe, it's cheap. Um, so like we think there might be benefit, but I do agree in order for this, for the vitamin D piece to become standard of care, we need to do a prospective clinical trial. I've been talking to Drs. Henry and Dr. Fish. There's some concerns about the feasibility of doing that and whether the data is ready to do that, but it's absolutely something that's on our mind. And I will leave it up to sort of everybody to decide whether they think the data is strong enough, given all the confounding that you talk about, talked about to, to currently test or supplement vitamin D. I'll also say that in our manuscript, and I don't have a time to get into it during this presentation, um, the uh, self-reported black patients in our study had about three quarters of them were vitamin D deficient. 
Um, so if you wanted to think about a population that might be enriched for patients who are vitamin D deficient, that either you could test or you just start supplementing, that might be an area to do this. We already know that African-American patients have much higher rates of peripheral neuropathy. We're not sure why, we think this explains it, but a lot more to do to untease all this given the confounding. So thank you very much. Agreed, thank you. All right, thank you. AJ Piper Villalo, uh, Leahy Hospital, Burlington, Mass. Um, so yeah, those are two of my questions too. How do you kind of um, prove the um, vitamin D is like a causative driver of the neuropathy? And um, I think, you know, in your future translational work, just assessing, uh, you know, additional sort of vitamin levels, like alongside vitamin D could help to, you know, demonstrate that like, it's not just a proxy for overall nutritional deficiency. Um, but really is a specific, uh, you know, and then I think um, really uh, like uh, determining whether uh, replacement of vitamin D could help actually salvage this, you know, increased neuropathy risk is critically important because it's such a safe uh, thing for us to administer. And so you could imagine, you know, uh, randomizing patients with a deficiency to either get supplementation or not um, to see if that uh, sort of increased risk goes away. Um, and if so, that would be a really strong sort of causative, you know, argument uh, for the, the deficiency. Um, and then the final thing I wanted to just ask was whether the cryotherapy um, gloves and like socks are allowed um, in your like future work um, and, and in the past, just given their sort of proven role for decreasing neuropathy risk. Um, so I'll start with the second part, which was the enthusiastic support for a prospective clinical trial on vitamin D supplementation. And I hope that the co-chairs have noted the support from the crowd on that. Uh, it's something that I would love to do just as much as everybody else would love to see it done. Um, in terms of your last question about the gloves and uh, the cryocompression and those treatments, until they're um, demonstrated or proven to be effective in Melissa Arcadino's 2205 study, I have allowed patients to continue to be on those things. I don't do interventional clinical trials. I think in that space, it would be troubling if you had patients on those uh, strategies. But for my biomarker work, uh, as it currently stands, I let patients do whatever they want. I don't think I can withhold that from them. And I don't think I would be able to enroll patients on my studies if I said that we weren't allowed to include that because a lot of the patients that we're enrolling now are saying that they are putting their fingers in ice or whatever the approach that they're using is. So it, it's gonna be a confounder, but uh, the, the current data suggests that it might be effective. Again, our committee hopefully will prove that, but in, until then, um, I let patients do it. So thank you for the comments. Yeah, we have time for one short question. Thanks, great. Congrats, Dan. Sorry I had to miss a part of your presentation, but it sounded fantastic. Nicole Kudra, Kirkland, Seattle. Just a brief comment and, and then the question. You know, toxicity, as you know, we've been on the sidelines, but have gotten wonderful comments now. So I think the fact that the community is still learning to really embrace uh, toxicity uh, efforts and, and focus on that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Um, the way we've dealt it with it previously was with education and guidelines to so bring the oncology community together and show the data and, and turn it into guidelines uh, that'll that'll change that's what happened with fibrinolipidemia with cancer social thrombosis and many other you know very acute toxic events that they can be fatal and you have another aspect here so don't get discouraged um quick question that the dermal pk um, are we already using that? That seems to be a PK seems to be a key feature as both for efficacy and toxicity will be likely highly predictive for many settings. Uh, can we do that at SWAC? Can you comment on that? Yes, so there are some research phase devices that can do transdermal PK collection. Uh, I have a colleague who's doing that in the uh, with tacrolimus in transplantation. I haven't seen anyone doing it in oncology, but I haven't really looked. It's it's ready for research use, it's not ready for clinical use. Uh, to your other point about the guidelines, uh, we are actually assembling a committee within MASC, which is the Multinational Association for Supportive Care in Cancer, which does a lot of supportive care type work. So if you're interested in this field, look into MASC. 
we just put together a DPYD focus working group. And one of our first things would be to figure out, should we write a guideline about who should be tested, when, in which clinical contexts, how, all those things. So I completely agree, clinical guidelines are key. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're now going to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about our two protocols, which are very close to being activated. Um, and then we will touch on the open trials um, after that. So first, I'm actually going to talk about um, the trial that I've been working on with uh, Don Hirschman and others, uh, which is looking at active symptom monitoring in young women with breast cancer with the goal of increasing persistence with endocrine therapy. Uh, so we're, we are hoping to activate this trial at the beginning to middle of November, which is right around the corner. So I know we've talked about this before, so I'll just go through the background really briefly. Um, so just as a reminder, active symptom monitoring is simply frequent assessment of patient symptoms, typically between clinic visits. And our hypothesis is that by using this, um, which is just six brief questions, um, on a weekly basis, uh, that we will increase persistence with oral endocrine therapy in young women with high-risk breast cancer, mostly by increasing patient-provider communication, um, which will then lead to reducing toxicity. This itself is not a symptom management trial. This is really more of a trying to get people together kind of trial. So our primary objective is to investigate the impact of active symptom monitoring on oral endocrine therapy persistence for 18 months. And then secondarily, we want to look at the effect on specific symptoms. We want to look at adherence, both patient reported as well as uh, based in blood. And then um, as we've been doing with a lot of our studies, we want to look at a risk model of non-persistence with endocrine therapy and looking at factors that are associated with benefit from our intervention. So not benefit from endocrine therapy, but benefit from using active symptom monitoring. So this is the key information we want everyone to be aware of. So we, pre, women have to be pre-menopausal at the time of diagnosis of hormone receptor positive breast cancer. They have to be planning to get concurrent endocrine therapy that can be either tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitor therapy and ovarian suppression or ablation. And the main reason for this is because we know that women have a lot more symptoms when they are um, have ovarian suppression or when they become postmenopausal with chemotherapy or bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy. And so we know that by having more symptoms, they then are at increased risk for um, early treatment discontinuation. So the three groups, uh, one is that women are just going to get concurrent uh, GnRH agonist therapy, which could be gisarolin or luprolide, can be given every four or every 12 weeks. Um, they can be undergoing bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy, and as long as that takes place, after they are diagnosed with breast cancer. It can be before they start the endocrine therapy or during endocrine therapy, that's okay. And also we're including a group of women who have chemotherapy induced ovarian failure, uh, where we think that they are postmenopausal when they're starting their endocrine therapy, but we know that that may not be permanent, um, but there has to be a plan to initiate GnRH agonist therapy or have people undergo surgery. Um, if they have ovarian function recovering while they're on the trial and while they're um, on either tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitor therapy. We're allowing a little bit of flexibility, can enroll up to two weeks before they're planning to start their endocrine therapy or within the two weeks after they start treatment. If women, I just went out. If women are starting tamoxifen, um, they can't have had prior tamoxifen for treatment or prevention of breast cancer, but they can be planning to start an AI. If women are starting AI therapy, they can't have had prior AI therapy for treatment or prevention of breast cancer. Um, they can, uh, but they can have had AI therapy if for treatment of fertility, like just for those five days. Um, and then they can get concurrent therapy with radiation, anti her 2 therapy, anti osteoclast therapy, PARP inhibitor therapy, CDK4-6 inhibitor therapy. We're trying to make it as open as possible. And I think I misspoke on the first bullet. If you're starting tamoxifen, you can have had prior AI therapy, um, just not chemo prevention with tamoxifen. Um, the other key things are they must have internet access or be willing to use IVRS, uh, which is uh, voice, uh, telephone based, um, and that's because of the nature of our intervention. They do have to understand either English or Spanish, and we will be opening this um, both in the US and in Latin American sites. 
And then we ask that patients not be planning to become pregnant during the 18th month study duration, although we know we can't mandate that. So the schema is fairly straightforward. It's a one-to-one -one randomization. Patients either get active symptom monitoring plus patient education, or they get patient education alone. They will come in for their usual every 12-ish 12, 12 week clinic visits um, for the, the um, 80 weeks, 72 weeks of participation. Then they'll have one more phone call at the 80 week period um, just to see are they still taking their endocrine therapy or not. At the time of each clinic visit, every single patient participating in the study will complete a battery of PROs. And at some of those visits, we will ask that they undergo blood draws. So the intervention is asking six questions based on pro-CTCAE. It's a five-point Likert scale, just you know, no symptom up to, up to very severe. And we're just asking about joint pain, hot flashes, vaginal dryness, insomnia, sadness, and fatigue. So things that are unfortunately very common in women who are taking anti-hormone therapy, um, but that most of which we can actually hopefully intervene on and help them feel better. So patients will be at home. They will either have their regular telephone or their um, some sort of internet access. They will get either an email, a phone call, or a text asking them to complete these questions, which they will do weekly for the first six months and then every four weeks for 48 weeks. Um, that the, the, the request to complete this, the questions will come from uh, University of North Carolina Procore. Um, they will respond, they don't send any PHI or anything, they just respond back and say, you know, what their answers are to those questions. If it's not above any of our preset thresholds, then the site does nothing, the site doesn't hear anything about it, and the patient just gets her next question the next week or four weeks later. If, however, the patient does have a symptom or more than one symptom that's above the threshold, the study site will receive an alert um, to let them know which symptom and how, what their threshold was. And then the goal then is to alert the clinician at that site who can then choose whether or not to reach out to the patient. Um, and then they will document, did they reach out or not? If they did, um, did they get hold of the patient? And also what type of intervention did they um, recommend? We are not mandating any specific intervention at all. And we're collecting it in a little drop down menu to make it as simple as possible. At least that's our goal. So all patients, as I mentioned, will complete patient-reported outcomes on paper at baseline in every 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. We have the optional but highly encouraged blood draws at baseline 12, 48, and 72 weeks. Uh, we're looking at estradiol concentrations because one of the questions is for people who are on um, the injections, the GnRH agonists, you know, how often are their estradiol levels going above threshold? We also want to look at um, objective measures of adherence to therapy. So we're going to look at drug concentrations and drug metabolites. And then our primary endpoint, as I mentioned, is looking at endocrine therapy persistence. This is defined as discontinuation of the initially prescribed medicine uh, for at least 60 days or switching to a different endocrine therapy than the originally prescribed one for any reason. And then we are not dictating how you suppress someone's ovaries. We're not dictating which endocrine therapy to give. We are not um, dictating anything about dose or schedule adjustments or about <laughs> symptom management itself. Um, just really briefly on stats, we are hoping to improve persistence at 18 months by about 50%, which is a big goal. Um, this is R01 funded. Uh, we received DC, uh, CIRB and DCP approval yesterday. Um, so we are working on the training um, materials. We are finalizing the actual intervention itself. And as I mentioned, we are hoping to activate by mid-December. And this will be open throughout the NCTN, the NCOR, and Latin American sites. So any questions or comments about this? We will be planning to have an actual training session um, once we know we're pretty close to activating either online or we'll have a kickoff at the next um, in-person meeting um, next May. So given our talk at the start of the meeting, how did you set the threshold for PROs that would be reported to the sites? Yeah, so the, that's a very good question. And so we admittedly are in a data-free zone as we were developing this. Um, what we decided to do was, so it's 
Um, it's a five point scale. And so anyone who reports a severe symptom or a very severe symptom, that will automatically be reported to the sites. And then we also decided if it was going to be at least a two point increase over the prior assessment. So not over baseline. So if you went from, you know, if you if you had zero zero hot flashes at the beginning and then you went up to mild hot flashes and then you went up to moderate hot flashes, that will not get triggered to the site. But if you go from, you know, zero to moderate in one week, that will get reported to the sites. We don't know the right answer. We're hopefully going to be able to, you know, we'll have collected a lot of data on about 250 patients. And so hopefully we'll be able to go back and look to see um, what happened depending on whether it was an absolute severe, very severe crossing of the threshold or whether it was a two point increase. Hopefully we can go back and look at that. We did actually think about having the two different arms be different thresholds, but that was um, going to be too complicated. So but it's a great question. Thanks. Okay, so in the interest of time, we will, and I apologize if you're online and asking questions because I can't see those. Um, interest of time, we're going to move on to uh, 2205 with uh, Dr. Accordino. Uh, this is the status of her um, treatment for CIPN trial. So, thank you, Dan, for uh, kind of setting us up to talk about the um, intervention trial to prevent um, CIPN. So I know everyone in this room knows how important it is to try and prevent CIPN. We know that in robust randomized trials, we currently don't have any known modality for the prevention, but in small studies that have significant limitations, cryotherapy and compression therapy have shown to be um, potentially effective. We recently completed a pilot study at Columbia of cryotherapy with frozen gloves and socks versus compression therapy versus placebo in a pick the winner design and the winner was actually compression therapy and we found low rates of adherence to the cryotherapy arm um, due to intolerance there is some thought that um, compression therapy in addition to cryotherapy so cryo compression can actually make the cryotherapy more tolerable to patients based on the gate theory of pain um, and patients can actually achieve lower temperatures of cooling, so potentially higher efficacy. So the goal of this study is actually a three-arm design to evaluate cryocompression therapy versus standard compression therapy versus low cyclic compression to um, figure out the most effective strategy. And we hypothesize that either cryocompression or continuous compression will be the most effective. And our primary endpoint is very similar to 1714, which is looking at the CIPN 20 score um, and um, looking at those that have a change of eight or higher from baseline um, compared across the three arms. Key secondary endpoints, we will look not only at the um, CIPN 20 changes at 12 weeks, which is the primary endpoint, but also look in a longitudinal analysis about the trajectories over time. Um, patients will have different assessments over time, and we will also compare mean scores of CIPN 20 um, at 12 weeks. We will look at adverse events. We'll look at cold intolerance, skin changes, other AEs. Um, we will also be looking at differences in the other subscales of CIPN 20, looking at PROMISE 29 domains. We will have similar objective sensory and motor function tests as um, were done in 1714. We're going to evaluate tolerability and satisfaction, look at taxane dose reductions, delays, discontinuation, um, and we will um, um, develop a biobank with Dan Hertz leading the helm in the translational department. So here is the schema. Um, these are for patients. Um, it's tumor agnostic, but there are specific taxane regimens that are included. So for patients who are starting weekly paclitaxel um, times 12, weekly paclitaxel with carbo, paclitaxel carbo Q3 times six, or docetaxel carbo Q3 times six. This is a limited institution study. There will be 25 sites. We actually have identified our 25 sites. We're really excited. We will stratify based on chemo regimen and it's one to one to one randomization to each of the interventions. There will be 259 patients um, in each arm. In terms of the intervention, um, it's 
will be given via a novel Paxman um, cooling device. The intervention will be applied to all four extremities. They'll wear the device um, 30 minutes before the taxane infusion, during the taxane infusion, and 30 minutes after for the cryocompression arm. It will get temperatures of 11 degrees Celsius, and the pressure will be cyclical, um, alternating between 5 and 15 millimeters of mercury. The continuous compression arm gets no cryotherapy, but has a constant pressure of 25 millimeters per mercury, and the low cyclic compression arm will alternate between 0 and 5 millimeters of mercury. Here is a picture of what the device is um, supposed to look like. Um, we will hope to have pictures of what the device actually looks like very soon, but you can see this is a, there are wraps that are applied to the hands and the feet, and there's a cooling system that is very similar to the Paxman scalp cooling system that will be able to apply both cooling and compression to all four extremities. Our key eligibility um, we spoke about earlier is the plan to receive one of the following taxane regimens and patients must be able to complete the PROs in either English or Spanish. Um, key exclusion are um, reasons why you couldn't have the wraps or the intervention, so skin wounds or ulcers, raynodes, or peripheral arterial ischemia, or if you've had neuropathy um, or have been exposed to potentially neurotoxic chemotherapies in the past. So in terms of our next steps, um, we have DCP approval from our concept. We've talked to the FDA and the uh, ID is not needed. Um, we have recently resubmitted our protocol to DCP and we're hoping to get an approval on hold very soon. We've identified 25 sites. Um, we're very excited about that. And then once we get our approval by um, DCP of our protocol, we will submit to CIRB and we're hoping to activate by the end of January if all goes well. And happy to answer any questions. Okay, well, oh. Can you use the mic? Sorry. <laughs> of study that because your control arm includes compression as opposed to nothing you know just being uh, getting standard of care for most infusion centers now that you might actually have a beneficial intervention but a negative study because you didn't compare to the current standard of care yeah so that this is something that we've really thought really long and hard about about what the best control arm will be it's challenging because our primary endpoint is a patient reported outcome which will always introduce the bias with how the patients answer the questions and obviously this is an intervention that patients can't be blinded to it's very clear if they're receiving compression or um, cryotherapy so originally our control arm was going to be the cyclic pressure um, going between 5 and 15 millimeters of mercury, which is the same strategy used for the cryocompression arm, but that same concern was brought up. Physiologically, we don't believe even the 5 to 15 millimeters will actually induce vasoconstriction and will actually induce um, a large enough effect to prevent neuropathy, but that's why we went back to the Paxman group and asked, can we drop that pressure even further? So the pressure is going to be zero to five millimeters of mercury, which we really don't expect to do anything. Um, based on our pilot study at Columbia, our placebo arm, you know, was loose garments, but because, you know, people are different shapes and sizes, we wanted to make sure there was no pressure. So we allowed up to three millimeters of mercury on those garments. So zero to five is very similar. So there's no perfect control, there's no perfect study, but we've really tried to weigh the risks and benefits of all of it, and we think that this is the best that we can do. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Just one comment uh, globally, which is that we hear a lot about, you know, how long and hard it is to get a study through SWOG from beginning to end and, you know, all of that. And, you know, I just want to say this is a study that involved three different cooperative groups coming together, all with similar ideas from beginning to end. You know, this study was, I don't know, a year maybe um, ish. And, you know, with a lot of people working collaboratively to make it happen. And if it's a good study and, you know, everybody's working together, you can get it done. So, you know, I just want to say, like, you know, that it's, you know, it is possible to get studies 
from beginning to end. And even, you know, when we think about our cohort studies, both you'll hear from a minute in I Check It as well as the CIPN studies, while it may take a while for those studies to get up and running, once they're open, they accrue really, really quickly. So if investigators are out there thinking of ideas, they should, you know, be positive and it's our job to try to help them get it through fast, but um, it is a great source because for that neuropathy study, if that data wasn't collected prospectively in um, with a really good phenotype, it wouldn't have set them up to get a sixth percentile on their very first submission for their RO1. So just as a part of the study. Yeah, 2205 is also a great example of someone doing pilot work at their site and then bringing it forward to SWOG and developing it into a multi-site trial. So next we're going to move to the um, active enrolling trials. So first we're going to hear about uh, S2013. Screen. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. Uh, so before I start talking about S2013 or I check it, let me share a, an interaction that I had with a lovely octogenarian who I met this summer in the hospital ICU bed. So she was diagnosed with the lung cancer and started on pembrolizumab, just uh, as the indication noted. She came in after her first dose, prior to the second dose, saying not feeling well, having falls, while driving to the appointment at the outside hospital, she had a double vision. She couldn't see clearly. So she got admitted and transferred to our ICU. She was found to have a troponin of 10. During that admission, also was diagnosed with myasthenia gravis, along with myocarditis, grade 4 hepatitis, and tachybrady syndrome. She, we started her on steroids and also on immunomodulatory treatments. She did recover and went home. A week later, presented again with the tachybrady syndrome, and we couldn't save her life. I wish there was a tool for all of us to know who would be these people that could develop these immune-related adverse events from immune checkpoint inhibitors. That's what this study is about, S2013, and I check it. So this is the schema of the study, which we'll go into detail in a second. So the primary objective of this study is to both develop and validate in the same study a risk prediction model for grade three or higher non-hematological IRAEs in the first year of immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy in solid tumor patients. We're also looking at the low-grade toxicities, not just the higher grade, and hematological toxicities, in addition to patient reported outcomes of chronic low-grade, grade one and grade two toxicities that cause burden on our patients. So to update you on the accrual goal, as Dr. Hirschman just mentioned a minute ago. So we have a goal of 2,062 patients, and so far we're at 463, 22% of the goal, which is very good. We also have archival tissue that we're getting along with this study. So we are at 263, which is 50% of the accrual so far. We encourage sites to also submit more archival tissue if feasible. And thank you very much for everyone who is already submitting this. And these are the top accrual sites. And thank you very much for all the sites for opening the study and enrolling. So this is the study calendar. Just to give you an example, once someone is eligible, eligibility criteria is open, 
Anyone who's getting immune checkpoint inhibitors for solid tumors can go on the study. It could be single agent immune checkpoint inhibitors or in combination. They would not be getting chemotherapy, targeted therapy, or other biological therapies along with this treatment. So once they're eligible at baseline, they would pick either paper or EPRO, and for the rest of the study time, they would be doing the same. So they, we will be getting the CTCAEs along with the PROs, patient reported outcomes. At baseline, we would also be collecting blood samples and optional tissue samples. We encourage uh, every site and all of our uh, site PIs to send these tissue samples if feasible. So once they enroll on at the baseline, there are four different uh, timelines where we would get the PROs and also the blood samples at week four, week 12, 24, and 52. If anyone develops grade three or higher toxicities, then they would be getting a blood sample at that time. So this is the uh, translational objective for, uh, we're looking at the cytox score, which is a composite 11 different cytokine levels, uh, both prior to and after one cycle of ICI-based therapy. And this would also be a huge repository for archival tissue and blood. So one more update on this study is that's in the works, led by our translational team, Dr. Hulis Govin and Dr. Kudrer, is to evaluate the association of baseline microbiome composition and metabolomics with the risk of developing IRAEs with immune checkpoint inhibitors, and also how these changes in the microbiome composition and metabolomics of the fecal microbiome um, would give us an idea of like who would develop these IRAEs severity. So there are three stool samples. One is at baseline, second one at four to six weeks after starting immunotherapy, and at the onset of grade three IRAEs. So this is another pharmacoeconomic analysis that is in the works uh, from our Latin American uh, group, is to look at the uh, weight-based and fixed dose uh, economic analysis, financial toxicity analysis, and analyze the correlation between these two doses and incidence of adverse events. The study would not have been feasible with, without our S2013 team, and special thanks to our patient advocates, Amy Ishwander and Anne-Marie Mercurio, along with our team up in the background who is doing all the work, Maria, Norman, and Crystal, along with Matthew Eng. Thank you to all the sites, and for someone who's not opened the site, please consider opening this site and enrolling so that we can get to this answer quickly. Thank you very much to all of our patients and their caregivers. Thank you very much. And for those, if you do have any questions um, for the sake of time, please feel, feel free to follow up uh, with Dr. Gunturu after the meeting. Is Jill here? I haven't seen her. Uh, so um, this is just to highlight um, Dr. Uh, Hamilton Reeves' ongoing study. This is the randomized phase three double-blind clinical trial evaluating immune-enhancing nutrition on radical cystectomy outcomes. And uh, this trial has been enrolling very well. There are up to 150 out of 200 planned patients. If you happen to be at a site um, that is interested in perhaps joining this study, even at this point, we would really like to make it over the finish line of the final 50 patients. And so please reach out to me. I'll get you in contact with Jill. And then we also wanted to just mention um, two other studies. So one, 17-14. Um, which is our CAPN observational study that you've heard a lot about today. Um, the one additional update that wasn't mentioned was there's an abstract examining baseline data, especially in um, patients with breast cancer, um, that's been accepted, or actually outcomes, accepted for poster discussion at, at San Antonio. Some, sorry, somehow that one didn't get updated. And then also just to mention 1614, as you know from um, many presentations over the years, this trial um, was uh, 
you know, has a lot of promise, but was having a lot of difficulty accruing. And we have finally decided that we're planning to close the trial for futility. Um, it is currently on a temporary accrual hold. Um, they are re reviewing it at the DSMB at this meeting um, to make a final uh, decision about whether or not to permanently close it. And we expect that it will be. But thank you to all of you who have listened to us over the years and who have participated in the trial. We appreciate it. And so I'd like to invite um, Dr. Geschwender up to the mic. Um, she is our patient advocate who has been with us for years and um, is back with us at this meeting today for the first time in a little while and would like to give some updates. So, good to see everyone. I'm patient advocate. Um, thank you to Anne Marie for keeping the seat warm. I experienced recurrence and have been in treatment for a long time, so Anne Marie stepped in to fill the role and it is much appreciated. Uh, at our advocate meeting this week we've talked a lot about DEI and had an excellent presentation from Dr. Melissa Simon. Uh, I would suggest if anyone's interested in health equity, you can catch her speaking again tonight at the cancer survivorship meeting um, at 515. I would recommend it. It's really a great presentation. So you have one more chance to catch it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to also thank um, Amory uh, for doing a invaluable role serving as patient advocate uh, for the last uh, period of time because we've had a lot of business going on in the committee. So thank you so much. And also, I think we managed to miss Dr. Lyman both uh, I think he missed our initial comments thanking him before he came in and he managed to just walk out before we thanked him again. So if you see him in the hall, thank you a lot for all of what he has done for the committee over the years as well. And I realize that we are now competing with the plenary, which is starting right now. So I just want to I'll stick these slides up there just so people can see them. Uh, we do have a couple of other studies um, that are related to PROs. There's a S1200 study and a couple of S. 1007 patient reported outcome studies that are all being presented at San Antonio. And then please keep in mind the Hope Foundation. They have done wonderful things for our committee. You heard two of the speakers in our plenary receive funding from them. And um, they do have some uh, grant funding opportunities coming up. And also please think about donating to them as well. Um, if you have any questions about ideas, if grants, anything like that, please reach out to me or to reach out to Mike Fish. We're always willing to listen. And thank you so much for coming.